um, United States Marine Corps. What was your highest rank? I got out of Sergeant E5. Eric, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Where were you living at the time? East Hartford. Why did you enlist? I wanted to serve my country. Do you remember the date? I signed up with the recruiter the day after my birthday when I turned 16. It was uh, the day of the, um, I was in running cross country at Free Service High School. So they came into the, uh, the race, the recruiters, and uh, brought me to their office in Manchester. My mother had to sign the paper to allow me to be in the delayed entry program. So you actually, so did you actually enlist at age 16? It's, a, it's called a delayed entry program? Delayed entry program. It's when you sign up to, uh, it's like a, a program to get you ready to go in. And you can't go in until you graduate high school. And what do they do to get you ready in the... In you the learn about the history, you um, do drill, close order drill, marching and stuff like that. You uh, go to different functions and at, represent your um, recruiting station, like push-ups, sit-ups, stuff like that. Who knows the most knowledge, little contests. Where did you actually do your pre-entry training? In East Hartford or Manchester? It was in Manchester, the recruiting office on... Um, I believe it's Main Street near the library, across street from the library. And the uh, recruiter's name was Staff Sergeant Tipper. How often would you train? Weekly, I, monthly? It was once a month officially, but we would go down there a lot more often. Because we're motivated to be in it. And so you, you want to be around Marines when you're going to go be in the Marines. Why did you pick the Marine Corps? I um, talked to the Army recruiter first. And um, he didn't impress me very much. And then um, two friends of mine came back from the Marines who were a higher grade than I was, that I ran tr uh, track with. And uh, they asked me to talk to a recruiter. And he was really locked and cocked and it just, he looked like a Marine. And that's what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be. When did you officially get inducted into the Marine Corps? Right after you graduated from high school? Yep. I was there four days after high school graduation. I was supposed to ship out in August but, or July, but I moved it up to June because I didn't want to wait the whole summer. And, you know, maybe <laughs> change my mind. I didn't want to <laughs> have time to think it over. So in June of what year? 1987. So I graduated high school and boot camp the same year. Wow. So that was cool. All right. So in June of 1987, you went to boot camp where? Paris, in Paris Island? Island, South Carolina. What was that like? It was hot. <laughs> Sand fleas. A lot of bugs. We used to run in the morning and uh, have all kinds of bugs biting us. And like, you know, mosquitoes down your ankles area. And How long was the boot camp? Boot camp was three months. Do you remember any of your instructors? Um, I had Staff Sergeant Smith, Staff Sergeant Smith, and Staff Sergeant Camp or Sergeant Camper. And what were they like? Um, S Sergeant Camper was a big, he looked like a bulldog, a black, they were all three were black. They looked like uh, regular people. The, the s sergeant was like a, um, looked like a bulldog, like you see in a Marine Corps bulldog. And he could stand th in the doorway and kick the top of the doorway. So it's like, and he was built, he was pretty big, an artillery guy, before he did the drill. Um, they were tough, but not like overbearing, not like you see like Full Metal Jacket or anything like that. They weren't abusive, but they were tough, and they wanted you to be tough. So, um, we ran every day. <laughs> we hit every sand pit on the island. and did, we did, uh, we call remedial PT. When they, when you piss them off, somebody does something bad in the platoon, they do what they call, they dig you, which is you go on the quarter deck, a little part of the barracks and you do exercise till they get tired. So, you know, you could be doing cleaning weapons, clean the barracks, and they just pick on different people to get up there and do exercises. Oh, so your whole platoon doesn't do it just who they... No, every, yeah, every, what? eventually everybody does it through the day. Oh. Thank you. And it's still broken. Okay. <clears throat> Where? Your room. 
what other things um, that they can do. Oh, put it back. Go around the other way. We um, first we learned. Um, we got first thing we did. We we got our haircut. I was the first person in my uh, platoon to get his haircut, and they put you in these receiving barracks first before they put you in a real platoon, and um, you start learning marching. You learn about procedures. You watch the DI. They have it in their closed circuit TV, which is the last time you're going to watch TV on the island. Um, you just start learning about you know. Paris Island, what to do, where to go, what not to do, which you couldn't go anywhere, you couldn't do anything, so it's like the only thing you place you went to was wherever the drill instructor told you to go. Everywhere we went, we marched in platoon formation. Everything we said was, sir, yes, sir, sir, no, sir. The only time I saw a woman was uh, when we went to the rifle range, and uh, it was kind of funny because the, the women would be very high-pitched, and you hear it, we'd say, sir, yes, sir, they'd be Ma'am, yes, ma'am. You know, and it was it was very funny because. Uh, hold on, Nikki. It just dropped. Okay, put it back up. And it was right here. It dropped right here. Okay. I picked it up. Dad, <laughs> if it fall down. Can we stop for a minute? Dad. As I was saying, the receiving barracks. You learned, um, you know, your basics. And you talked to other recruits and stuff like that. Um, and then you got picked up by the drone instructors. Um, and put into a platoon. How big is a platoon? A platoon was about 80, 80 guys, but then they would whittle them down to about 50 or so, because people would drop for some reason, various reasons, like they have, um, they couldn't keep up with the uh, physical part, or they'd be turned psychotic, or... So what happens if you can't keep up with the physical part? You'd get sent to the physical conditioning platoon, we call it the pork chop platoon, or PCP. Um, so you get that if you didn't couldn't keep up or you couldn't cope or couldn't hang. You did the sea bag drag, they called it, you know. Um, so we learned how to march. We would sing songs in the formation to keep your, keep the time, you know, and um, the drill instructors would take turns being on duty at night and uh, and doing things with you during the day. Some, pe some were better at drill than others. Some were the disciplinary guys, you know, if you... And they all, you know, um, they all could do the, the drill, but some were better than others. Um, so, pair, and they, they taught you, uh, they did, we did hand grenades, we did um, 45 caliber pistol. We learned about different um, aspects of the Marine Corps history. We actually had sit-down learning, where you sit down, you, you take notes, and the instructors would give you... Um, they go over enabling, enabling learning objectives and things like that, and uh, they have different military topics. You were given an, a book of knowledge, basic Marine Corps knowledge, and you have to study it. You have it in your uh, pocket all the time. And when you weren't doing anything, you just stand around, you'd pull out your book, and you'd read your, your stuff. Or you would be reciting things, like your general orders, or the cycle of operations for the M16, things like that. We'd learn the Rifleman's Creed, this is my rifle, things like that, you know. I will keep it clean and things like that. You learn the law of the law of war, the code of conduct, things like that. And um, and also you learn uniforms, how to keep uniform clean, how to iron it, how to uh, put on ribbons and badges, and uh, things like that. We also you also learn close arm combat, bugle sticks, which is uh, um, they look like Q-tips, large Q-tips that you hold in your hand. Because they're padded on either end, but they're like it's almost they're simulating a rifle. So you're doing close arm combat with your rifle, and you go up against one guy, two guys, three guys at a time. You're wearing a helmet, and they're wearing a helmet, and you know you have padding and stuff, so nobody really gets hurt too bad. You just get popped around a few times. Um, well, I remember there's you know, and you got these big guys sometimes that are there that they rule the fugal sticks, you know. And uh, I went up against not against the big guy because I wasn't that rank there, you know, I wasn't. I'm not a big guy then. I was 135 pounds, actually. So, um, so I'm like, I was half the man I am now. <laughs> but um, I went up against two guys, I remember, and uh, I hit one of them, then the other guy got me. Cleaned my clock pretty good. Because <laughs> you got to take out one and go for the other, but by that time, the other guy's got you. So that was the end of my pugil stick days there. <laughs> um, we didn't do any organized sports. You just ran or you did your um, confidence course, obstacle course, 
you know, um, from you, you work from sun up to sundown, and then even more, even longer, you know. Now, in basic training, boot camp, um, you didn't get specialized training yet. You didn't know what you were going to do for uh, for your job or your duty. I was uh, guaranteed infantry. Oh, you were? Did you request that? Yeah, I requested that when I, I joined for six years, what they call the quality enlistment program. You joined for six years? Yeah, I were off the bat. Why so, did you want infantry? Well, I wanted to fight. And I figured that would be the best way to do it, would be to get an infantry and mix it up. I'm not a, a, I'm not a violent person by nature, but that's, at 17, 16, 17, I figured that's what a Marine did. You know, I didn't have too much knowledge of the other, like, computer skills or, or satellite intelligence or cook or truck driver or anything like that. I thought a Marine went in there, got the job done for the country and got out, you know. After your three months of boot camp at Paris Island, where did you go? I went, I took some leave and went home. For how long? I had 18 day leave and I spent nine days in East Hartford and then nine days in Florida with my father and my brother. Then where did you go? Then I went to uh, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, where we got sent, shipped off to a, a smaller camp in, in Camp Lejeune called um, Camp Geiger, where they had the School of Infantry, or SOI. And that's where you received your infantry training? Yep. How long were you there? I was there, it's a 28-day training cycle, but it was three months. So it's, it, so on all the training from boot camp to to your school is about six months long. So I learned from there, we, we did further, we got to pick what part of infantry, because there's different parts of infantry. You have the machine gunners, you have the mortarmen, you have the uh, dragons, and uh, that's it. Um, what did you choose? I chose dragons. What are the dragons? Dragons are an anti-tank missile. They will hit a, any, it'll destroy, supposedly destroy any known armor up to a thousand meters. It's wire guided. And in the Israeli war, we were told that um, out of 75 Israeli gunners, 75 were killed because after they killed their tank because it kicks out a signature. There's a back blast when the missile fires and it just at the back of a tube and it just goes down range, ding, 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 ding. it goes 100 meters a second, so at 10 seconds, you're sitting there tracking this tank where there's other tanks around you could take you out because they know where you are. So, um, so after infantry school, I got sent to, um, which actually infantry was really fun because we were in North Carolina and we, um, in Jacksonville. I mean, when you weren't trading, you could get to go out in town on the weekends, so you would hang out with your friends. Now, what friends was your rank at that time? I was a Lance Corporal, which is E3. I went in, I went in as a, um, a PFC because I recruited two people, and plus quality enlistment program gives you rank faster because they got to give you some incentive to sign up for longer years. So, um, so in North Carolina, we had a lot of fun. We bowled, went bowling, and we went shopping at the Jacksonville Mall and stuff like that. And um, and we I was there from October to um, the end of December. And um, so you... This would have been still 1987? 19, yep, 1987. It's a good year. Three graduations of that year. And then you, in December, you graduated from the infantry training? Yep. And where did you go from there? I was guaranteed in my contract to go to California, to West Coast. So I wanted to go out to Camp Pendleton, California. And that's where I was sent, 1st Marine Division. Well, during training, you're, you're considered attached to the 2nd Marine Division that's headquartered in Lejeune. There are three, uh, actually four divisions in the Marine Corps. There's the 1st Marine Division, Camp Pendleton. 2nd Marine Division is in North Carolina. 3rd Marine Division is in Okinawa. And the 4th Marine Division is the Reserve which is, was in New Orleans. I don't know if they're still there, the command anyway. What did you do at Camp Pendleton? Camp Pendleton, um, I was attached to uh, 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines as a Dragon Gunner. And then they did a little reorganization of the, um, of our unit where they would, uh, they, moved, they moved the 7th Marine Regiment out to 29 Palms, California. And we, 
after well, we did about a year, and I did a float with well, three seven. We did a um, a flyover to Okinawa. You were a year in California. No, no, I was five and a half years in California. I was a year with the three seven, third battalion, seventh Marines, first Marine division. And while you were you were five years at Camp Pendleton. Five and a half. Because it was six months training, and then five, and I spent the rest of it in California. Now you did a flyover. What's that? That's where you do a um, Western Pacific tour. You fly to Okinawa, and you are the um, one of the units that, in case anything happens in that part of the world, you're there. You're the one that's going to go fight. So how long did and this was? You stayed in Okinawa. You stayed in Okinawa for six months. That was the uh, length of the tour, and then you fly back home. So what did you do while you were in Okinawa? Uh, for when I first got there, I had mess duty. Which is you go you go work at zero dark thirty. You prepare the breakfast and the lunch for everybody, and uh, you just be their their galley slave. Okay, you're just an extra hand helping out, which you know it's not a problem because not a big deal. I mean everybody has to go through it one time or another. Everybody's turn, you know. Um, excuse me. Then we went to uh, we actually got to fly. We they broke our platoon up to we were weapons platoon dragons dragon gunners. They broke us up because we have to reinforce other platoons, other line infantry li companies who are just riflemen. We give them the heavy armor support. So in case they're running up against the enemy, we have to be there to take out the tanks so they can, you know, close in with the enemy and, you know, shoot the bad guys or whatever. And um, so we divided up into three sections and we went with three different line companies and we were their dragon, their armor support. Well, we went, they, one w went to Mount Fuji, Japan, one went to uh, Cobra Gold in Thailand, and we went on a ship with uh, Kilo Company, and we did what they call a mini rim pack. We're on the rim of the um, Pacific Ocean. We were on a, um, an LSD, the San Bernardino, and what we did, it's a Navy ship that's a landing ship dock that has tanks, a couple of tanks on it, um, no helicopters, it's not a carrier. But uh, the crew is there to fight, you know, it's, a, it's not special operations capable, but it is able to meet many threats that might occur. Um, now you went on this LSD while you were over in Okinawa? Right, right. And we hit, um, we did some training with the Malaysian Marines. We did um, training with, we did Team Spirit, which is with the Koreans, South Koreans. Um, so we had a little, oper we did a little operation. We, uh, we did a few uh, ship to shore things like uh, with what they call Amtraks, or armored assault vehicles. And uh, we did a few things like that. We did fast roping. What's that? It's so where uh, if you're in a helicopter and you drop the, the rope out of the ship, out of the helicopter, you can slide down the rope like a fireman's pole. We did rappelling, which is, you know, like you see in a mountain, mountaineer show. Yeah. You have the rope and you have this brake hand. You either can bound down the hill or it can... Uh, take a lot of jumps down, slide right down. How long did you stay in Okinawa? Six months? We were there six months, but we got off the island for two months to do this tour. There's a little rim pack, and we hit uh, Thailand. We, well, we were in Phuket, Thailand. They actually got hit last time with the tsunami. And so uh, if I went back there today, I probably wouldn't recognize it. Really? Yeah. I mean, it was like paradise, these places we hit. I mean, Malaysia, Indonesia. We hit Bali. We went to, I mean, this is just, you go there, put up a little display for people if they want to come on board the ship. We're waving the flag, you know, and show people in America that we're not really bad guys, you know. Most of the world thinks we are. What was the training like when you trained with other, like the Koreans and the Malaysians? It, it's almost like training with a little kid because they're not, their weapons aren't as good, their training is not as good, they're not as motivated to do well or to do anything. They're very, I mean, um, people overseas, they like to hold hands, the men. And we don't consider that very manly over here. And we didn't consider that very manly when we were in the Marines. So <laughs> we didn't really respect them too much, but we, we actually treat them like little brothers. We actually trained with the uh, Nepalese Gurkhas, the British Royal Army. And how was that? We actually had like a field day with them, played soccer and sports and stuff like that. And that was pretty cool because they had the curved knives, what they call the kukri knives. And these guys have to run from their mountain homes to, to sign up. Like, it's like 20 miles away. They have to make their way 
to the British recruiting station. So these guys are warriors. They just don't look like it. So, you know, but um, we enjoyed it. I mean, it was a fun thing. It's a, it's a fun trip. I mean, if you're into the military stuff, it's really fun. Plus, you, you get to do the military stuff, and then you get to go on Liberty, which is uh, you're off duty, and you can go into town. You don't need a, uh, your military ID is your passport. And you can go in civilian clothes. So did you get to be a tourist in all of the oh, yeah. countries yes. that you went into? Oh, so yes. You saw a lot of tourist sites when oh, you yeah. were there? Well, a lot of uh, bars and stuff. <laughs> I don't think I went to any temples. or I, In Malaysia, I, I did go in a mosque. And I don't think I was supposed to go in there, but there was no one around, so I went in anyway. I put the things under my shoe, the, I guess they're a little covered and stuff. But I didn't wash or anything like that. Was, later on, I learned I was supposed to do certain things, but... There's no one around to chase us out, so we didn't really have to worry about it. After your six months for your flyover in Okinawa, where did you go? Came back home to Camp Pendleton. And we had the homecoming and everything, uh, all the cheering and everything. I wasn't married at the time, so I didn't have anybody to come cheer for me or welcome me home or things like that. So, I mean, I was happy to see other people were getting their loved ones, and it was pretty cool to see that I like that you know see the people you know we didn't nobody was killed or anything over there so we brought everybody we brought there we brought back which is really good but were you gonna later did you go back overseas to Iraq yeah yeah that's so your whole same platoon that went over on your flyover came back now did you stay with that same group for the whole time you were in the service no no um, what they did was they took three seven and they what they did is roll up their colors retired them for a little bit Transferred them to 2-1, and then um, bring the 7th Marine Regiment, reestablished them out in the desert on 29 Palms in San Bernardino, California, out there in Mojave. And we were transferred, my company was transferred into 2-1, and then 2-1 was also, I think, brought out to the desert. And we became the 4th Rifle Platoon for 1-1, 1st Battalion, 1st Marine Regiment, 1st Marine Division. We became Delta Company 1-1. One, one. And now wait, Delta Company, you that's your company, was Del and 1-1 one, one yep. stands for? First Battalion, First Marine Regiment, First Marine Division. They call us First of the First. Uh, it's a big red one, or a big one, and it says Guadalcanal on it. The First Marine Division really bloodied itself in Guadalcanal, World War II. So, I mean, we keep a lot of the traditions, so you, you learn what you're... Regimental history is, and uh, you know, you just keep that alive. You keep that going. And if you have rivalries with other units, you keep that going too. You know, like one nine or three five. You're just, you don't like them. You know, it's just something you go through. We met, and with three five, we saw in Okinawa. We didn't like them. They didn't like us, and we just kept that little animosity thing going. Who's the best? We're the best. You're the not. That's not. All right. So as Delta Company in one one. You stayed in... Uh... Okay, this was 88, 89. Okay, we became Delta Company 1-1, and we learned we are going to become a MUSOC, which is Marine Expeditionary Unit Special Operations Capable. M-U-S-A-C? M-E-U-S-O-C. And what we did was um, we trained to um, different missions that we could possibly go on on a, on a six-month deployment on a, on a convoy of ships. At this point, you don't know what your mission is, though? No. It could be anything. It could be um, an extremist hostage rescue. And, you know, we're the last... They're going to start killing hostages. we got to go in and take them out. Um, there's trap, tactical recovery of aircraft personnel, which we did in Desert Storm. That's later. Um, there is uh, ship takedowns, oil rig takedowns, um, different missions that you could possibly call out because we're the only ones there. You know, we're the only ones who are equipped to fight on the ground for 30 days unaided. The Army can't do that. Or they couldn't do it back then. I don't think they can do it now. I'm not too up on the Army. But because our convoy of ships carried all the weapons, all the ammunition, all the missiles, all the, the food, all the bandages, you know, that we needed to fight unaided on the ground for 30 days and put up a really good fight against any country, really. I mean, so we had our own Harriers. We had helicopters. We had tanks. We had armored assault vehicles and a four-ship convoy. So, and we also had the hel attack helicopters, the Cobras. So on, on top of all this, we had tows. We had um, 
towed his tube launch optical side wire guided missile, which is, will take out any tank in the world without them being able to hit us because of the distance involved. Um, so we, we were armed for bear. You know, there, people don't realize how much firepower there is in a, in a MUSOC, the Marine Expeditionary Unit. A MUSOC is these four ships that has all yep. of the equipment. And we're aided by prepositioned ships. They have what they call maritime prepositioned ships, where out of Diego Garcia or Guam, they load them all up and they have them floating around different sections of the world in case you need to resupply, restock, they're there. You know, and we have with us Harbor Masters, we have SEALs, we have um, Force Recon, which is the Marine Corps Re Force Reconnaissance. SEALs are Navy, but you know, we work, we work hand in hand with the Navy on loading, offloading ships, uh, flight operations, things like that. And during general quarters on ship, we just go to our bunks, play cards, and they do their work, they do their ship defense drills and stuff like that. We do man overboard drills. Uh, when we came into Pearl Harbor, we manned the rails. We got dressed up in our, in our um, dress C uniform, which is what they call Charlie's, and we had to uh, salute the uh, U.S. Arizona coming in. Wow. So. Now, this was on your way The second overseas? USOC. This was the second USOC coming into Pearl Harbor from California. We now went out of Long where Beach. Where were you headed? Uh, just different countries, different areas that possibly we could have, uh, you know, been at war with or, or helped out if they were at war. Um, we almost duplicated the um, the same rim pack kind of thing. You know, we hit friendly ports and you know, you're, you're kind of like a political backup for people, to for them, the government to show that U.S. Uh, has confidence in us, that's why the Marines are here and you know, it seems to me looking back, that's what we did, shoring up different governments, things like that. So you had four different times that you went out on these MUSOCs? I went on uh, two MUSOCs, one flyover, and one uh, Desert Storm uh, excursion. In that order? No. First we did the flyover, yep. then we did a MUSOC, then we did Desert Storm, then I did another MUSOC. Alright, so when, after your first MUSOC, you went back to California? And then they, then we did a little bit of training and we did, um, um, you know, we just did a little stand down, took some time off and regrouped, got some new guys in, do some train, a lot of training, you know, to train new guys. And at that time I'm a uh, corporal. I picked up some rank. And uh, we did um, explosives, worked with the um, well, uh, land navigation packages, different training things that we did to, um, to make us better Marines, you know, and to get the little, the younger guys bring them into the fold and get them up to speed. Because it seems that when you go to the fleet, which is they call the Fleet Marine Force, after school you kind of forget everything it seems, and you know. So this is like a refresher course. Oh yeah. When did you find out that you were going to go overseas to fight in Desert Storm? Well, I heard in um, I think it was in August that we heard about the the there was problems brewing over there. You know, so I'm thinking, oh, it's the Middle East. They always have these problems. Not not going to affect me. So I went home on leave for two weeks right. to August, Connecticut. Are we in 1990, I think it is. Okay. So you went home to Connecticut on leave? I went home to Connecticut on leave, and then um, we came back, and it's like we had to go to the desert right now and learn, you know, get, do it at home, up, hone up on our desert training. So I got sent for two weeks first to uh, uh, School of Infantry for tow training in case we need, because we heard the Iraqi armor, they have over a million pieces of armor. So we need to get some people trained on the toes, because there wasn't enough people doing... Right, now, toes as in T-O-S? T-O-W-S. Which stands for? Tube Launched Optical Sighted Wire Guided Missile System. It can uh, remove any tank. I mean, it just, it's an awesome weapon that uh, we sell to our allies, but not the night sights. The night sights are top secret, because they can see through smoke and fog and night. And it's just, uh, it's just awesome. It's like, like they say the artillery of the other of the enemy is bombing you with gas or something. The sights don't even see through that. You just see the um, the infrared um, signature of the weapon of the vehicle you're, you're shooting. And this is what you were trained on. Yep, I was trained on that for uh, two weeks, and then I be, I got the MOS of O352. Before that was O351, which was anti-tank assault dragon slash small. Now small the other side of your O351 training. You learn. 
Uh, it's like it's what they what they call a bazooka. Now it's a um, 83 millimeter rocket launcher with a 9 millimeter spotting rifle on the side. So wherever you hit with that spotting rifle, there's like an inch or two dispersion of where the rocket's going to hit. So you you're usually with it's a what they call crew serve weapons. You're with a spotter, and you're shooting there helping you load and they're carrying ammunition with you and. So they load you up and you, you're shooting it and they tell you to launch, make sure there's no friendlies behind you because there's a 90 meter back blast. It's actually a rocket, all the rocket fuel is expended before it leaves the tube. And it's, and it's loud. Does it take two men to man this? No, you can do it one man. But it takes two to spot, you know, to make sure you're on target and everything. Make sure, and he's your security. Because when you're shooting that rocket, you're the rocket, you know what I mean? You're shooting the target. Here, it could be other unfriendlies coming up on either side of you to get you. So you're kind of uh, a sitting duck there. So that you got your security guy. Who's watching yeah. for that. Usually you're not, you're not all by yourself, but you're within an infantry unit, but you never know right. when infiltrators can come in or, or whatever. So after your two-week training in the desert with this? No, it, it's, it's two weeks training with the, with the toes, and then we went to the, um, then we went to the desert. Okay, then, okay. Desert. then desert in 29 palms. And you just learn trench warfare and and run and going through the wadis and the, of you know, Mojave Desert because um, Saudi Arabia and Iraq and Kuwait are gonna be similar in similar situations. How long did you stay in the desert? Desert was two weeks. Then where'd you go? And then we um, waited around. Camp Pendleton did our inspections. Every time you go on, on overseas, you have to have all your gear ready, cleaned, everything folded in 12 by 12, you know, out on the parade deck, and then the colonel's going to come by and make sure everybody's ready to go. Yeah, so we had about 100 of those, <laughs> well, it felt like 100, but, and uh, you just do a lot of PT, physical training, and get yourself ready to go. You're going to do uh, powers of attorneys, wills, make sure your insurance is in order, because we felt that uh, we were going to lose a lot of men, and we planned for it. And they would start tr start bringing a lot more recruits to uh, what they call the um, replacement platoons, ca uh, casualty replacement platoons. And, um, you know, so you meet some of these people while you're over there, it's like, wow, you're going to be my replacement if I get killed. You know, it's kind of, you know, weird to, to talk to somebody like that. You know, and they became camp guards, and the, kid, the people who were supposed to replace you if you got killed or whatever to fill in. So they were camp guards and things like that. So it was interesting. So you knew you were going to Iraq, but you didn't know the exact departure date? We, yeah, we knew we were going to go to um, Saudi Arabia. We didn't know our mission. We didn't know what we were going to do there. We didn't know things like that because um, that's top secret orders. I mean, you, there's all kinds of, you know, what they call um, S4, S5, which is rumors, gossip, stuff like that, you know. Who's who? Who has the latest scoop? You know, because you and if you're in the front lines, you don't hear anything until they're ready to tell you. If you're in the S shop, which is like the uh, admin people, they hear, they're you know the intelligence or whatever. They hear things. They see things in satellite views, and they get special maps and stuff like that. And um, so we didn't hear anything really. We knew we were going to Saudi Arabia to train, so we got to Saudi Arabia. We we're all in green. So For, when happened? When did they call you up? When did you actually know you were shipping out? Oh, uh, we could have got the call any time because I'm act I was active duty. So you're theirs. Boom. You're 24-7. You're theirs. Do you remember what day you left? Uh, I was in January. I don't remember the exact date. So now it's 1991. Now it's 91, January. And, um, and you shipped out to go to Saudi Arabia? No. We took a United Airlines flight, actually. And we got, we got on uh, buses to go to... Um, Edwards Air Force Base. I think it was Edwards Air Force Base in California. And, or Otis, Otis or Edwards, I'm not sure which one it was. I think Otis was, well I don't think Otis was. I think Otis on the East Coast. It was Edwards, I believe. And um, we had all our weapons with us and we had security rounds. And we loaded, we brought all our weapons with us on board this United Airlines flight. It was totally military with civilian airline attendants and pilots. What was that like? It was interesting. I mean, you always see people checking, you know, checking at the airport. We we bypassed all that. We didn't have to worry about the security. We were security. I mean, there's no security can mess with a Marine Corps uh, 
battalion that's going to want to do something, you know. There's just no way. So was it a direct flight from Edwards over to Saudi Arabia? No, we went from um, Edwards to New York City. We landed in uh, either Kennedy or LaGuardia, and we refueled there. And then we flew to uh, Brussels, Belgium. We weren't allowed off the plane. <laughs> um, so we saw, well, Belgium's pretty, okay. <laughs> Time to go. <laughs> We were able to look out the door in the window, and that was it. And then um, we had to bypass Italy for some reason because they weren't supporting us at first, I think. They wouldn't let us use the airspace. So we had to fly around the boot from Brussels. You know, everybody else let us go through their airspace. But even though we're, you know, the most powerful country in the world, we still have now to respect... you're still in a United aircraft? Yep. Still in civilian aircraft. And this is what they call Operation Desert Storm, or De Desert Shield. Okay, so we land in um, uh, Dharain, I believe it's Dharain, Saudi Arabia, and uh, Air Force Base, semi-secure, but you don't trust the Arabs because the Arabs are, are Arabs. They don't, you know, they can be swayed with whoever has the most money, so we don't, we don't trust them, um, even though we're there, our allies, this and that, but. So we're there in desert, and we're in green camouflage utilities because we haven't been given our desert camis yet. We don't, they were not even issued those. So, we're there in our greens and we're kind of sticking out like a sore thumb in the desert. But eventually, uh, we get acclimatized for a week and a half, two weeks to the desert, the sand, sun, all that stuff. And we finally get our camis and we move out to the, um, from Dharan. We get trucked out in uh, civilian buses of the, um, and they stopped the buses for a second, and they were like, what's going on? Why is this guy stopping? The bus driver gets off the bus. He's there in the sand praying. You know, he's faced the east. He's praying. It's like, we never seen this before. We, ne we didn't learn too much about Islam and, you know, the Muslims and things like that. So it's you were back at Dharam, where did you, did you have barracks or did you sleep in tents? Or? We were in tents and cops because they didn't want us on the ground because you never know what's on the sand, you know. Like, I mean, Iraq could have uh, infiltrated Saudi Arabia, and, and we had a real fear of um, them putting a nerve agent or something like that, a biologic agent, sprinkle it in the sand, so that when you kick up the dust, you possibly could get it in, you know. Mm -hmm. So we didn't know. So we kept, they gave us cots and everything. So we put some of the cots, we set up these large barracks-like tents, and, uh, you know, an open, open tent, so you have rows of cots on either side of the tent, and you set up a security watch. And, uh, you know, you all, everybody has ammunition, so it's like, you know, you're ready to go. All right, so where did the buses take you? The buses took us out to the, the I'm not sure where. I mean, we, had, we call it Dead Camel Road because there was a dead camel in the road. There was nobody around us. We were in the desert. They dug for us trench systems that were, were similar to what the Iraqis and the Russians, because the Russians trained the Iraqis. So they had the Russian tactics. So we set up to fight Russian trench lines, the, the W's and the, the, the diamond formation with the command controls in the back and they have the trenches on either side. So we're training there to go in to infiltrate the trenches, clear them out and destroy the enemy. You know, that, that was our job, to get in there and mix it up and get it, kill them. So we're training for that in the desert. We didn't shower for like uh, three weeks. So we were pretty ripe. <laughs> In the desert, and how hot was it? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, at first it was cold, though. We had to wear uh, coats in January. It was kind of cold, and it rained a lot on us, too. So it was like, wasn't really, it was probably in the 40s. And then a month later, it's in the, it's in the 110s, you know. Um, so we got, um, every day we're hearing different things from people, you know. And finally we got to this thing called Division Supply Area, Division Staging Area, DSA. And we heard... We, we got briefed by the uh, colonel that the, they started the air war. Okay, in, in mid -Jan I think it was mid-January. January 16th, I started the, They started the air war, and we heard about that, and it was like, yeah, oh, that's cool, you know. So now we're finally, gonna, we're finally here for a reason. We're finally going to do something. So we, go, we keep moving closer and closer towards Kuwait, and now we learn that um, there's about, there's about 90,000 Marines now in Kuwait or in Saudi Arabia. We have 1st Marine Division and 2nd Marine Division. And we're going to be on the east side of Kuwait and the 2nd Marine Division is going to be on the west side. The Army is going to button hook around us to, into Iraq to engage the um, 
Republican Guard units, the Army units. So we took on the, uh, went through the um, stage there in February, and it was, um, I think, February 24th, 23rd, 24th, something like that. Where we staged, we went to the staging area and we were in armored assault vehicles in our task forces. And I was Task Force Papa Bear, first time, first Marines. And I was the anti tank assault for third uh, platoon from 1 1 of uh, Delta Company. So I was, I was with two other, um, or three other uh, small gunners, 0351s. And we're, we're you know, going to get in there and get a, be their bunker busters and take out the machine gun nests and things like that. Also we have with us, we have um, you know, the M60 machine gunners who will give the support for the infantry, the O3s, we call them O311s. Those are the ones who actually have to carry the rifle. We, we carry rifles too and pistols, but we are kind of behind them. We're not as, we don't move You'll with them as a unit. You pistol, rifle, plus that? Well, no, the, the uh, all not a tow. The tow is on a vehicle. Oh. Tow is huge, it's a big system. It's on a vehicle, um, but the O351 is, is portable. You can carry the small with you. It's a, just like a, it's a tube and a rifle on the side. It's, it's about, loaded, it's about 30 pounds. Okay, or a little more, maybe a little more. So you're there with your gunner, or your A gunner. You know, you're the assistant gunner. I was the um, squad leader for my, my squad. And we, what was your rank by now? I'm still a corporal. Rank is hard to come by in the O351s because they're, um, they're locked in, pretty much. What they do? A corporal is higher than a lance corporal. Yes. Okay. It goes private, private first class, lance corporal, corporal, sergeant, staff sergeant, then gunnery sergeant, uh, master sergeant, um, so, and then uh, master gunnery sergeant and sergeant major. Also, first sergeant's in there with master sergeant. I only got sergeant, so <laughs> I only got that high. If I had stayed in, I, I right now I'd probably be a gunny or a first sergeant. I'd stayed in, unless I went to the uh, college, and then I would have gotten uh, become an officer. So anyway, we're in Desert Storm. We're uh, getting divisions. We're in the staging area. We're staging our vehicles, getting ready to go. We get a briefing by the um, the colonel comes in and says we're going to be the division support. Okay, we're going to be Task Force Pop Bear. We're going to um, Task Force Ripper is going to be the main effort. They're going to go. We're going to blast through the obstacle belts. Are my unit. And we're gonna let other units go by us. Because in Kuwait, they, they set up these two obstacle belts to prevent us from going in there and, and kicking them out of the country. Which was, uh, you know, they have trenches filled with oil and they have, um, you know, minefields and stuff like that. So we had to breach those obstacles so other forces could come through us and, you know, engage the enemy that are right, you know, with vehicles and stuff like that. So we did that, we blasted through it. We um, cleared the lanes, we marked the lanes so that they wouldn't, if they veer off the lane, you hit a mine, you'd blow up your vehicle. So we went through there, we, um, and we became, after we blew up the minefield, we became division support. So we were like the uh, go-to guys in case there was another mission coming up or someone we didn't know about was on the, on the flanks or um, came out of nowhere we didn't know about. Because they had um, revetted their tanks where they dug them in and backed them in and made them stationary artillery. So you didn't need to have to know how to drive it, you didn't, have to, you didn't go to gauge it because everything we have that's moving, that our planes will take out. Because we ruled the sky, we had air superiority. We had, actually, we owned it, it wasn't superiority. We had, there was no planes flying there that we didn't take out. And we, we um, after we cleared the obstacle belt, we stopped for a little bit, we went in there what they call mop level two with MOP level is a, um, it's called Mission Oriented Protective Posture. It's, in, it's with NBC suits and gas masks. So we went in there, MOP level two, which is you have the charcoal suit on and the boots on, but no gloves and no mask. Okay, so you, you have your gas mask on your side, ready to go. You have nine seconds to put it on and clear it if you get a, a gas attack alert. And we didn't have to, we never had to do it. We never had to put it on. I think we had to put it on one time, and that was, uh, I think it was a false alarm that we know of, you know. And they give you tape to put on your arm. It's like a, um, it will detect um, any kind of NBC agent, nuclear, biological, chemical agent that they could have used. Or we uh, have alarms, things like that. They, have a, they had a couple sniffer trucks where they could analyze the air and see what they're, and they were like a nuclear proof 
You couldn't, you couldn't even, if even a nuclear bomb hit it, they'd still survive, the, the vehicle would still survive. Was the fear of NBC a big worry for you? Yeah, I think that was the most thing I was worried about. I wasn't afraid, but I was worried that, you know, because when you start seeing people drool or do the funky chicken, that's when you know something's in the area. You know, I was afraid that we weren't be able to detect it. You know, it's the things you don't see that, that make you kind of uh, think twice about things. But, I mean, we train with putting our gas masks on. We train with drinking out of our canteen with the gas masks because there's a little straw that comes out, a little thing that pops in the top of the canteen, and you just tilt your canteen up, and you drink through the straw inside the MBC mask. Now, if you puke inside your mask, you're, you can't. You know, it's like you can't take it off because if you do, you die. So, I mean, you have to train to shoot your rifle with the mask on. What's that like? It must be pretty awkward. It's hard. It's hard to do. So... At, at this point, what you're doing is like you're just like popping rounds off. You're not really aiming like marine marksmen do, in that case, because you're hampered with the this equipment. And there's a hood on over your gun. It's really hot, so you have to move slower than you normally would. And it, it takes a lot out of you. So you, you drinking and you're wearing the suits anyway. So it's like you know, you got to really watch for heat exhaustion and watch your troops. Make sure they're not. Cause that's why we got to be in good shape to uh, do that. Otherwise, you know, you can't have every every everyday Joe doing it because they die. So you train for that. So we went in there and we staged and we went in there and um, cleared the minefields. We cleared and we um, went in the. Um, we saw these oil fields were all on fire. Because the Iraqis, when they pull when they're pulling back, they torched everything. Because Saddam was going to make this big ecolo uh, ecological disaster. So, I mean, I was like 10 feet away from a burning oil well. Wow. Did you get pictures of any of this? I still have my desert camis that are um, singed? not singed, but have we got rained oil on. Because all the black smoke with all oil, it was in the air. And it was, um, when, when it rained on it, it was black. And I got dots on my, uh, stains on my desert camis. I still have desert camis. So what was your role when you were there? There was probably nothing that you could do for that. No, I didn't. No, they, they later they brought in the um, fire guys to uh, cap them, like Red Adair or something like that, or whoever it was to cap the oil wells. I mean, you, what you do, you put a, you blow them, really. You kind of have to blow them out to, to get rid of all the oxygen. That's, they, they pull the oxygen in. But it's like um, we just had to stay kind of clear of them and just keep your eyes open because, I mean, we had um, to make our own our own explosive, like uh, what they call um, uh, what they call them. We had we had uh, C4, which is an plastic explosive. So we made our own um, mine clearing um, our own mine clearing uh, stakes. They gave us little pieces of uh, uh, fence post, the green ones that you can put the chicken wire on. Has a little uh, it's. It's like um, a U-shaped, almost, like a, like a uh, channel. And then on the side, it had a little thing for you to put the wire through it. So we took those, and we lined them with C4 and deck cord and time fuse and made our own improvised mine, uh, mine clearing things with it. O351s are trained that. We, we train in, and also not only with anti-tank, but with explosives. We're like so the, that was part of your job? Yeah, we're like the company engineers. Okay? If we don't have any engineers with us, we do it ourselves. Yeah, so. How long would you say, like, how long a period of time were you in the field cl clearing the obstacles? Are we talking days, weeks? No, we're talking quickly, like two hours, three hours, four hours. Oh. We blew through it. Like, I mean, they have, on the back of some tanks, they have what they call line charges, where they sh shoot out a big line of explosives, and they land there, and boom, 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 and they clear paths with those explosives. I mean, we do it quick and dirty. We're not there to clear every little mine out of there. We clear it. So our vehicles don't get blown up, and we, you know, when we're marking the paths, we have to make sure that our artillery is not trained on those um, paths, because they do what they call counter artillery ba batteries, where they can trace back if the Iraqis shoot at us, they can uh, trace back where the um, where they're shooting from, and counter battery and get them. And when when we when we cleared the obstacle belt, we saw the artillery come through our position, so it's like, wow, this is fast. You know, because they're way, they're way in the back, supposedly. But when they're moving up, it's like, we're really moving here. And we clear. it took us not even four days to clear to the airport. 
So once you cleared that whole stretch, then the artillery came in and you stayed where you no, were? No, no. First, Task Force Ripper came through. Yeah. Okay, and they're going to go engage the enemy and keep, keep, keep pushing them back, kicking them back, you know. And then we're going to go through there and just uh, get ready to do whatever the general says we're going to do. Okay, whatever the orders they're going to give us. And then when we, we pulled off for a break, I guess, for a couple hours, we're going to stand down a little bit, you know, to collect ourselves, make sure everybody's all right, you know, refinish the water, you know, make sure you pass out the bullets, make sure everybody's good to go. No funky chickens, you know, <laughs> no drooling, and, you know, make sure our men are good and they're hydrated, they're fed. Um, so the artillery comes through while we're doing that, and it's like, wow, you know, these big artillery pieces. You know, you see them, like, in trading sometimes, but you don't ever see them up close. Because they're, you know, the 11th and 12th Marines are the artillery guys. And they're in their own separate camp, and, you know, you're in your separate camp. You don't really mix with them. You call for fire from them, but with mortars, we have our own call for fire, you know. Yep. Things. We have uh, spotters with us for the artillery who will call in for us missions if we need to. And we, you learn how to call for fire also in, when you're infantry. So everybody can get on the radio and say, you, this, and me, fire mission... One, two, three, four, fire up uh, Alpha Bravo Zulu 25. You have grid maps that are um, already pre marked that they re register their guns on. Thanks for the rubber band, Dad. Okay. Now, did you ever engage the enemy while you were doing your mission? We captured 1,600 prisoners. My, 1,600? Yeah, my. Um, tell me about that. My, my unit, we, they surrendered to us. I heard they were surrendering to news crews. I mean, cause we, we um, shot up a few things. You know, we, we engaged the enemy a few times, and we were in the largest Marine, mechanized battle in, in the Marine Corps history, in the Albuquerque oil field. Um, Albuquerque, spell it. Al A L B U R Q U A N, So I'm not sure how you say it. <laughs> and uh, that was considered the largest mechanized battle in the Marine Corps history. Because we were engaging tanks and armor personnel carriers like for a couple hours during the night, which was pretty cool, you know, lit up the night sky pretty good. Um, was it after this battle that the 1,600 prisoners surrendered to you? It wasn't. It wasn't that one time. I mean, we we took the um, and it wasn't me. I went. I like your unit. I'm like Audie Murphy or anything, you know. <laughs> but um, my unit. We took. We sent them all back. It's kind of cool because we sent them all back to the 25th Marines which is a Connecticut regiment, the Connecticut Reserves. Did you know any of the guys? No, because I was in California. I didn't know anybody in Connecticut. You know, um, but I, I also have a picture of their, their unit in the staging area because we staged right next to them also. It was for, I don't know how they did that, but we were right next to them. I got their, I took a picture of the regimental colors and everything. And it's kind of neat. So we sent, uh, every person we took, we searched. We were in two-man teams. And what you do, you have them spread out, spread eagle on the ground, face down, okay? And you have, you give, uh, whoever's searching you gives, gives you their rifle, okay? So the guy can't grab their rifle, you know? So what you do, you, um, we have them spread eagles out. We had to search these guys and make sure, because sometimes they would have grenades under them, you know, the more fanatical ones. Yeah. These ones didn't, thankfully, but, you know, we're, you keep, um, him in between you and your man so you don't shoot your man you you're gonna sh shoot him your man's over here and you're gonna roll him over towards you keeping him between you and he might have a, a grenade or anything so he would take the blast if you know if anything so you search him carefully all we found really was packs of cigarettes and stuff like that you know intel you send up to the you know to the battalion level did he, they speak english no so we had to feed them and we had to make sure we respected them as people because our, in our what they call MREs, the uh, meals ready to eat, we had pork, some pork meals, so we had to make sure we couldn't didn't give them the pork meals, and because you, you had to feed them, you know, you have to feed them and safeguard them and make sure they don't get killed and you don't kill them, and because if they're surrendered, they're they're now you're like your children, you have to take care of them now. So I mean, so how any did they, how did they act? Um. They were scared because they had been told that we eat our. Uh, the Marines were, uh, you know, to, you had to kill someone to get in the Marines, you know. And they believed that? I guess, so because they, they were... pretty vicious? Yeah, they thought we were, you know... It just... It was funny, because I mean, they were shaking, and they were, you know, they thought we were going to kill them, you know. Because they'd probably do the same thing to us. They'd probably kill us if they captured us. 
they probably would have gunned us down. But we didn't do it then. We just captured them and sent them to, back to the rear. You know, we marched them, all their hands on their heads, you know, just marched them back to, you know, the division's area, you know. We didn't march, we sent them back. We didn't... You didn't even accompany them? No. I mean, we disarmed them, took all their goodies, and just, you know, sent them on back. Because they didn't want to be there in the first place. After all that bombing, you know, but the thing is, we went, we went to these bunkers, and we found um, boxes and boxes of AK-47s. You know, and 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 um, ammunition. So if they wanted to, they could have given us a good fight. You know, if they were in any condition to fight. I mean, they were like, um, since they were bombed back to the Stone Age, you know, they were they dazed were and confused, and they didn't have any food, no water. So I mean, we and we dropped leaflets down telling them how to surrender, how to you know either any kind of white thing, any kind of you turn your weapons upside down, you. Um, if you have a tank, you, the tank is pointing to the rear, and they did that a few times. They had, um, I've heard that they, um, they looked like they were surrendering their tanks, and they would swivel around and then try to engage U.S. troops. The leaflets that were dropped, what languages were they written in? They were written in Farsi and Arabic in English. Were there any casualties in your unit? No. The whole Marine Corps, I think, suffered like 100 casualties the whole war. So, I mean, it was like a walk in the park, really. It could have been a lot worse. But, uh, I mean, Vietnam was bad. I mean, because we learned everything from Vietnam. I mean, that's what you train for. You learn from the past big war. And you, you train for that. So, I mean, we um, we even tried a few things, new things, like the captain thought of like this, what they call a checkerboard defense, where you would get set up a fighting team every 300, meter, 300 yards. And you could do it in the desert, because 300 meters is the splash of a mortar, of a artillery round. So if you're bunched up, you know, if you're within 300 meters of everybody, you're gonna, all going to get killed with that one, you know, artillery barrage. So you spread out 300 meters, and if a tank runs through your area, you're, you're underground, kind of, so you can, you know, try to engage the tank with the anti-tank uh, AT-4s, which everybody got, I mean, well, the non, the non 0351s got the, got AT-4s, which is like a modern-day version of a law rocket. So when, how long did you stay in that position? We were in, well, that was just the training during training that, yeah. but then the Desert Storm thing was four days. And then where did you go after the four days? After that we, we were at the, uh, we went up to the uh, Kuwait International Airport in Kuwait City, and we ringed the city, but they didn't let us go into the city. Why? Because they wanted to have the Arabs take the city, oh. which was a joke to me because, I mean, whatever, you know. We did all the other, other fighting, you know, so no big deal. It just meant that we weren't going to get shot up by other stupid Arabs who were, you know, when they, when they celebrate, they shoot in the air. You know, and they have no, no control over, their, you know, they're, they're drunk with power or whatever, and they're drunk with victory. So did you stay at the Kuwait airfield? We stayed at Kuwait International Airport, and um, we heard that there was a ceasefire, the Bush called a ceasefire. And that you were at the airport when you heard that? Yep. We are dug in little fighting holes, and we were, you know, in, in our teams. So we were guarding on the road leading to the airport, I believe it was the south road, coming up into the airport, you know, the, one of the only access routes. So we were, make, we were using that to cut off. Because when, when, they, when they got International Airport, they used it to land other, you know, big, bigger planes and everything. So you can come right up on the battlefield area. So that was kind of neat. What was it like when you heard about the ceasefire? What was the reaction? I was kind of disappointed. They weren't going to Baghdad. They weren't going to finish the job. We weren't going to go take out Saddam. Do you think that was the general feeling of all of the men? Yep. We're like, what the heck was this? This was nothing. Why are we even here? You know, the army could have done this. You know, they wasted our talents, really, you know. We want to fight. I mean, that's what we're there for. We are, we join to fight. We're infantry. We fight. That's what we do. So it's like when we couldn't fight, or when there wasn't enough to fight, it's like a big letdown. You train your whole career to go into combat, and when you don't, you know, I mean, we're, we're glad that, you know, hey, we're going to go home soon, because nobody wants to be on the desert, because the desert's no fun, you know, <clears throat> so. So after the ceasefire, how long did you stay at, uh... 
We were about there for about a week at the airport, maybe two weeks. And then we came back to what they called the division support area. And that's the same place you had been before in the division support Right, okay. where we um, got all the, you know, the mess tents and you got the, you know, the, the box of food. And we got called back in after the ceasefire to go to the, um, the Albuquerque oil field because we had heard of a, they were recovering pilots who got shot down or had crashed or something, had the RPG rockets hit them or something. So we were online in the desert looking for this, for the uh, downed pilot that we heard. It was a specific downed pilot? Right, it was the last pilot of the war, that we, the last MIA. And in order for the family back home to receive their money, their insurance money, we had to recover the body. So we, we found the body at a, um, an abandoned camp and what they had done was they had dragged this guy from the from the crash site and he was all battered and bruised and beat up and bloody and was dead and he would, they put it looks like they put him with his parachute in a trash heap this pilot who he crashed and he yeah he was i think he was the ob the observer for a, um for an A10 i think so he was just a single person in the right. plane i mean the uh, the pilot had bailed out and the co-pilot or whatever the, the spotter crashed the plane. He might have been dead when he hit the ground, but we think he was dragged from the crash. I think he was alive when he landed. We think he was tortured. So we uh, had to, had to um, spend a night out in the desert after, you know, the ceasefire was called. You know, we were all rearmed. Cause before we had turned in our, um, our C4, our deck core, you know, anything they could accidentally blow ourselves up. You know, they didn't want us to have any, any fun, you know, with it because... That's what gets people killed. Why kill? You went through the whole world getting killed. Why kill people when you right. don't have to? So we handed all that stuff in, and they rearmed us to go back to find this guy because you don't know whether the Arabs are going to keep the ceasefire or not. So we did that. Went back there, and did you uh, know exactly where you were going. Did you have a pretty good idea of where Hi. he was? Hello. <laughs> we we thought he was in the general area of the Albuquerque oil field, so we had a whole battalion online looking for him. Mm. And we were spread out across the desert. And he just walked the desert for a couple miles. And, you know, just in case he was in a hole somewhere or, you know. And there was no resistance. You just found his body. In you the just bed. found his body. Didn't We we went through Kafji, though, because we, we were, Kafji was shut up Saudi Arabian town, right on the border of Kuwait. So we went through there. We saw the, because the Iraqis weren't supposed to go to Saudi Arabia. If we didn't get there in time, they would have taken over Saudi Arabia, because that would have been 40% of the oil. They would have had instead of Kuwait, just 20 percent. So they um, they shot up Kafji and they, they retreated back to Kuwait. And we went through Kafji to see that. And we saw these things shot up and all these uh, burned out buildings and everything. It's it kind of interesting to see. Was it your unit that brought the uh, MIA's body back? We stayed with him till they got a helicopter the next day. We so we stayed overnight with them, and uh, you know we set up a defensive perimeter and uh, secured the body. And they came, the, um, whoever handles the bodies, you know, I guess to whoever retrieves bodies like that, came with a helicopter, and we, uh, and then we went back to the di division support area. And then uh, how long did you stay there before you were shipped back home? It was probably about a two weeks. Because we, we went to the division support area, then they moved us back to these um, real buildings. And they had um, catered food and stuff like Pakistanis because the Kuwaitis don't do anything themselves. Everything's hired. They hire everybody. Okay, so we had um, Pakistanis or Indian caterers uh, doing the mess halls and stuff like that. But you had regular barracks and beds to sleep in? Yep. Yep. After we got pulled back, we were getting ready to go home. And then we came home on the, another United, I don't know if it's the same plane, but it's another United plane. I guess they had donated or contracted with the government. I don't think they donated because, you know, they got to make their money too. And we came back home and it's like, there was like tons of food on the plane. There was, um, they were playing Whitney Houston's God Bless America. You know, her, her um, she sang the national anthem when, back when she was still Whitney Houston, not, you know, not a druggie back then. Or not as bad, or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's very moving. And then when we got to um, California, back back home almost, uh, we're in the bus and people are lying in the roads. And it's like, wow, what are you guys doing? You know, what? You know, they're cheering us on and everything. Like, 
they're putting cases of beer on the on the buses. You didn't expect that? No, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like wow, this is amazing. You know, it makes you feel really uh, special. You know, when they do that. You know, I mean, the Kuwaitis were happy we were there because they were, you know, we took back their country for them. But we didn't expect our own people to be so. The Vietnam vets never got anything. I mean, they never got the parades that they deserve, but we didn't expect parades. And we, we actually went on, we did parades in on San Diego. We did a parade there, and they, when we got back, and it was uh, every other corner they, they announced was, the Liberators of Kuwait City, 1st Battalion, 1st Marines. Like, like, I don't know if we did all that, but, you know, they, they played it up, I guess. Were you awarded any medals or citations? I was given uh, a meritorious mask for not killing anybody who surrendered, which was actually a felony, because that's murder. Um, and we were given classes, actually, on what to do with prisoners. You can't kill them if they're surrendering. They're your, you, you own them, so you have to safeguard them. If you do anything bad to them, you're going to be charged with something. So we were very careful not to abuse prisoners. We didn't do anything with dead bodies. We didn't do. It. We didn't mutilate anybody. I mean, not none of my unit that I know of. <laughs> I'm not trying to say to cover my in blood or anything, but as far as I know, we were pretty good with the, you know, bodies we found and with prisoners and stuff. And for that, you're awarded the meritorious mass medal. Yep. Yeah. That wasn't the medal. It was just the, like a commendation, like a pat on the back. We were ordered, uh, rewarded with, I guess, the Kuwait Liberation Medal from the government of Kuwait. Uh, we got the combat action ribbon for going into the uh, combat area, national defense ribbon, Southwest Asia medal for the theater of operations. So I think that was it for the for that. Well, you were overseas. How did you stay in touch with your family? We could write letters, did and you we. Use email yet? No. Did you write often? No. That's often as my wife did. Oh, were you married by now? Yeah, I was married in 89. So I married a year and a half before that. What was the food like? Uh, we had MREs. And we were down the whole time? Yep. How was that? Uh, some are good, some are bad. <laughs> some are better than others. So it's basically prepackaged. Uh, yeah, it's freeze-dried and uh, not heated. But so you have a canteen cup. You can, if depends on what the on the situation, you can make fires. If not, you know what they call heat tabs, which is like a sterno little tablet. And you heat it and you heat your coffee up or hot chocolate or food or whatever. But usually you you kind of on alert, so you really couldn't do fires. So you eat everything cold. So you must have been glad when you got back to real food. Yeah, it was it was pretty cool. I lost some weight in the desert. <laughs> Did you have enough supplies and other resources that you needed? Yep. You didn't want for anything? Nope. They even had bottled water for us from Saudi Arabia. So. Did you feel any pressure or stress? Um, I was excited. I wasn't afraid or anything like that. I was I was very up for it. I'm usually an up person anyway. But uh, I mean, I saw some people kind of like, you know, cowering a little bit and uh, and crying here and there. You know, it's like, but I was like. I'm so excited. I want to get in there and mix it up with them and, and, you know, do something, you know, finally get to do something. Just, the adrenaline was going. And that's why it was such a letdown when I couldn't. So. Was there anything that you did special for good luck? Um, no. I don't believe in good luck. You know how some people have rabbit splits or metals I don't or whatever. Know. All I know is I can shoot straight and uh, my, my gunner is a good gunner. The guy Did led. you stay with the same group of men the whole time yes. when you were over there? Yep. Yep. So you probably became pretty tight? Um, we were tight before, you know. Because you had all trained together. Yeah, we, we, yeah we, we, trained, we were together about six months before that in, in, in Delta's company. And our um, captain was a, was a good guy. He took care of us, you know. What's his name? Captain um, Hamilton. No, 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 wait, 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 it's not came out, no, that came after. Uh, <laughs> oh, shoot, I forget his name. It'll, it'll come to you. I'm sure it will. Tell me later. I know, I know we had uh, Gunny Lechner was our uh, company Gunny, and he was tough as nails. 
And he was the man who would be like, um, Men, we're gonna find out who did this. Throw the rope over the tree, hang him by the balls. He was, you know, blood and guts gunny. I mean, he was the guy you, you heard about in the newspaper, you know, or maybe you didn't hear about it. <laughs> but, you know. What did you do for entertainment? Um, in the Was there any we had books. We had some books. People had some um, Walkmans they brought with them. Did you have a Walkman? No. So, you know, you read your letters from home. Maybe get Stars and Stripes Daddy. newspaper. Hold on a second. Daddy! No, no, Nick, we're almost done here. Sort of, I think. Yeah. Halfway. Stop. Stop. Go away. Go, go. You have one of this thing here. Yeah. Ready? Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's <laughs> uh, my children. Two of my Did children. Did you have leave at all while you were overseas? No. Were there any entertainers, any USO shows, anything like that? There were. We heard about them. We never went to any. Did you not have the opportunity or you didn't want to? We didn't have the opportunity. Nobody asked us. Do you know who was over there for USO? I think Steve Martin was there. Uh, I think even Bob Hope went over there, I think. I know the president went over there. Um, Did you see him? Didn't see him. <laughs> I didn't see anybody. I saw the commanding general of our division. That was it. And that was briefly. Did you have any leave while you were overseas? No. In Desert Storm, you mean? No. Some people at the at the end, they were able to go to um, Bahrain. A couple of people, or the token two, I think. You one of them. No, we didn't get didn't make that list. I'm about to piss somebody off. Do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual events? Um, well, it, I don't know if it's humorous, but we kind of uh, blundered into a minefield. Where and when? In um, when we were assaulting through uh, Kuwait, and uh, we realized that it was like, okay, everybody, stop moving. Yeah, how did you realize it, and how far? Because we saw we saw the prongs sticking up here and there, like around the edges, like because I was I wasn't leading the the platoon, the, uh, platoon there because I was attached to it, so I did, I was like in trace of them, so everybody's like stop, everybody, retrace your steps that you usually get in this little area here, so we all did, and it's like you idiot, let us do a minefield, you know the point man, <laughs> you know, so that must have been pretty scary though. Well, that was more funny than scary, because I, mean, I deal with mines, you know, I know how to, I, I mean, me and my gunner were the only ones who probably could defuse the mines that were there, I mean, not a big deal. So you retraced your step and everybody else Everybody got out, got and, out we, and we marked the minefield, so anybody who came up behind us or, you know, would know that there was a minefield there. So you just mark it and go on? Yep. You don't blow it, you don't clear it, you just mark it and go on. Do you recall any other humorous events? Um, we did, um, a Valentine's message home. What was that? Uh, we had a video, I can show you the video later, of, um, everybody saying, uh, hello to the loved ones and stuff like that, and they'll be home soon. It was Valentine's Day, we were out in the desert, and they came around, the, the chaplain came around the camera, and, um, so the married guys and the guys could take the, the video and, uh, send it back home. Well, we showed our fighting holes. If you if you all did it on the same video. Yeah, and the, and the chaplain sent it back to the um, the family support back in, in base because they had a big uh, family type thing where they have newsletters and things like that to send home and tell the family how we're doing and. So then each family back home got a copy of that or got we, to yep. see it. we had um, the captain's wife would um, um, it was Captain Proudfoot um, would. Um, would set, make copies and, and give them to the wives, and each wife from each platoon would then pass it out to other wives. You know, we had a, a big support network. So the wives, you know, because a lot of them were young wives, and it was their first, you know, overseas thing, and it's like all of a sudden it's wartime. You know, I mean, they didn't have any time to be broken in. You know, they they were just new to the to the Marines, and they had any problems. How did your wife handle the stress of having you in combat overseas? Um, she was stressed out. She watched the news every night. She'd pray every night, go to church a lot, um, send me a lot of letters and things like that. And every every so often I'd get a care package, you know, full of goodies. And a lot of people would do that, get care packages. And we'd share with, everybody would share with everybody else. And you know, you'd get, people would get sent books and things like that. And 
I mean, because the oil fields were on fire, we could you could read at night. You know, if you go to 50 percent alert, you're kind of got a few couple hours of chill. You know, to not every, not at once, but so you could read by yeah. the light of the oil fire. Yeah, gives whole new meaning to oil lamps. Yeah, I mean, Aladdin didn't have anything on me. <laughs> But um, so I mean, that was the that was Desert Storm, pretty what much. What did you think of the officers and your fellow soldiers? Oh, we we before we went back, we had to do what they call Operation Car Wash, which was we had to uh, make sure all the vehicles and tanks were cleaned out because the Department of Agriculture would inspect them. We can't bring anything back to the U.S. that would have any kind of detriment to our own agriculture, um, any kind of plant spores or things like that that might be you know they wouldn't know about. So we had to um, have these big bladders that had bulk, they were bulk fuel bladders, but we filled them with water. We had to rinse off all the vehicles in the tracks and in the inside them, and we had to uh, wash them all. We had, we spent a week or two on the car wash detail. We went to clean a thousand vehicles. Wow. I mean, you know, my company alone did that. You know, different companies rotate through the car wash thing, but so we had to make sure everything was clean. We had inspectors with us to inspect all the, make sure all the nooks and crannies didn't have any uh, stuff well, on them. Did you need to do a similar cleaning of, of your, peop your, your own purses when you came back? Nope. So you didn't bring anything nope. back? Nope, just the vehicles. So, I mean, yeah, I guess I think it was more for NBC than anything else, you know, make sure they weren't, they didn't drive over anything chemically and just, you know, bring that with them and end up killing people back home with chemicals. Did you feel ever that you'd been exposed to anything? Never. Never. So that wasn't a fear once you got home? Uh, I've, I've read about it, you know, in, in Desert Storm. A lot, of a lot of people said, oh, we got exposed to this, exposed to that. I never felt anything like that. I mean, my children are all perfectly fine, no birth defects. Um, I have nothing that's service-related illnesses or anything like that. Now, I know you told me off-camera, um, you were, uh, you had, one of your children was actually born while you were overseas? Well, that was after Desert Storm. Okay, she was born while I was on float, another float, oh. the next float. Dad. So when I came home from Desert Storm, um, we, um, we, had, we got off the, um, off the plane, off the buses. We marched into Camp Pendleton, into our home camp, and the families were around the parade deck cheering us, you know. So we're marching in like, you know, we just conquered the world or something. And, you know, they're all cheering and you're glad they were home and everything. And um, we put our weapons away and we, they let us go home or to the barracks or whatever. And um, so my daughter was born nine months later or ten months later, whatever it is. The, nine. Yeah. Well, it's what, 40 weeks, I think. I don't know, whatever. Anyway, um, and we did the Lamaze classes too at Camp Pendleton. And it turned out that I was gone two weeks before she was born. We had Christmas early and everything. So you what left this? Another float. Another float. Where, another Daddy? Float. where was it located? Dad. We we uh, Daddy. left. It. Wait a minute, please. What's this Leave it alone. Now? We went out of law out of uh, San Diego, 32nd Street Naval Station, on a on another Musoc. Yeah, I mean, usually it's 18 months between floats. We had 13 months. So I, in four years, I went uh, in five and a half years, I went on four flo four trips overseas. So two weeks before your daughter was born, you went off again, and she was born. When well, was born um, yeah, she was born January twentieth, nineteen ninety two. And what did you call that? I call that the, the camp newspaper called that Operation Desert Stork, because the baby boom after Desert Storm. I'm guessing you weren't the only one. Well, because my wife wanted, you know, she said, because she realized, you know, that we could go in a drop of a hat. We had, we had like 18-hour notice before we had to go overseas if, you know, if we have to go on alert. So, she wanted, if, if I got killed yeah. overseas, wait a minute, they, um, she wanted to have at least a part of me still alive with her and all that. What did you think of the uh, officers and your fellow soldiers? Um, I know you're a Marine, you don't call them soldiers, you're fellow Marine. The officers were all boots, <laughs> and they got a boots, a new guy, like, you know, wet behind the ears still kind of thing. So we had a couple of boots with us, a um, couple of good lieutenants, but for the most part they were kind of uh, dependent mostly on their, on their senior sergeants. 
which is as it should be, but they should have been a little more involved. I mean, they all got bronze stars for leading the platoons. And maybe I'm a little, I don't know, resentful that they got them because, I mean, what'd they do? They didn't, we didn't really engage the enemy too well because we, you know, there wasn't really actual, that much actual combat comparatively speaking to other, you know, engagement there could have, that there could have been. What about the, your fellow Marines? Oh, uh, they were, they were dedicated. They, um, they knew their jobs. They, I had all the confidence in the world with them. Now you said you had trained with the same group you went over with. Did you stay in touch with any of them after the service? Only one of them I did. And he's my, um, I ended up being his godfather. He got baptized in the Catholic Church. I ended up being his godfather. And he was the godfather of my daughter. So it was kind of interesting. Does he live near you? He's in Oklahoma. Not near you. Right. We email every now and then. We email jokes and things like that. And, you know. Now, when did uh, after you went on your second MUSOC and came home, where did you go? Were you still out in California? Yep, still out in California. And how long were you there before you were discharged? I was there another year. We came back in 92, and I was there until June of 93, until I got uh, what they call terminal leave, which is you take your leave and you go home. Because they were cutting down the forces. I was going to re-enlist, but um, they had reduced the force of the Marine Corps. And um, watch out for the cord. They reduced, and I got caught in the downsizing. So, I, and in fact, I got laid off from the Marines. And when was that? In 1993. What, do you remember the month? June. So did you then officially get discharged from the... Yep, I was officially discharged. Um, I got six months commissary privileges and four months medical because of the uh, involuntary separation really because I didn't want to get out and there was no no place to put me because they cut down all those people out of the on the Marines so so I came back here because um, it's where I grew up I was never a man here and I left here you know a boy and I was never really an adult in my own community so I came back here plus I heard that they were given free tuition for college for Desert Storm, Aww. or for you know military vets in the um, combat zone. So did you go back to school? So I went to Central. I went first. I went to Manchester Community College because I didn't know how I was going to do it in college. Yeah. Uh, I was always pretty smart in school. And I was in the college bombing program, but I never, um, you know, I never went to school. Did you know what you wanted to do for your career at this point? No, but my wife suggested teaching because I taught you know my junior Marines. And I loved history, so went out to teach history. So, so I, you went to Manchester Community, then Central Connecticut State yep. University. Now, did you use the GI Bill for that? Yep. What, what that is, you pay twelve hundred dollars in boot camp, thousand, hundred dollars a month for twelve months. You sign up boot camp, and after that, they give you thirty-six months of um, money to use for college. So, in effect, I was um, actually being paid to go to school because of the. The tuition was paid for by the state of Connecticut, and um, you know all I do is pay the fees, and the GI Bill took care of the fees, really. So I end up actually end up being coming back to the state because now I'm a state teacher at uh, Prince Tech. So you graduated and got your BS in education. Yep, BS in well history, BS in oh, history, yeah. and then uh, for teachers, and then I got my MS in history. Central also. Yeah, Central. And how long have you been teaching now? I've been certified since 1997. So in 93 I got out and started with school right away. And, I and went full time? Yep. And have you taught at the same school since then? I started out as a substitute teacher at East Harvard, East Harvard Public Schools. And then I went to this private school in Manchester. Um, and then I went to um, the technical schools in the state of Connecticut. I had three different schools. Started out part time in Torrington, which is uh, Wolcott, and then I went full time in Danbury to Abbott Tech, and then uh, at, I'm now at Prince Tech. I've been here three years. Did you join any veterans organizations? I start. I joined the VFW, but not really to be part of the fraternal organization. To I wanted to uh, rent a room, a rent a hall for my friend who was getting married, my best friend. So I kind of felt guilty about that, you know, because I wasn't, uh, 
I don't know, I usually think that VFW is for old, drunken, you know, really Vietnam era veterans or World War II veterans who, you know, but I mean. So are you still a member? No. No. I'm a member of the Marine Corps Association, which is just, um, it's not, there's no meetings or anything like that. I'm also a lifetime member of the Non-Commissioned Officer Association. And I was a member of the First Marine Division Association, but I don't know if I didn't keep up with that. Because they're out in California, and I'm here in Connecticut, so I'm not going to go. Has your unit had any reunions? No. None that I know of. We don't really, I mean, I haven't seen that. Only like um, World War II era people do that, or Vietnam era. They're probably still too young. Maybe they do it, you know. Well, I know of a gunny who lived in Maine, who was one of our company gunny. A different, a different, after going elect there, it was different, there was a different gunny. He was out there, Gunny Vargas, out there in Maine. I heard, but nothing ever, I mean, they're just so spread out, because when you go to California, you could have anybody from anywhere. They're mostly Southerners and Westerners, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, dispersion. I was one of the few East Coast guys. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I teach, I, I, have, I see a historical bent towards American and its wars. I mean, you could teach U.S. history through the wars. And a lot of people are more into the social aspect, but I, I, it, all, it all rolls up together to me. I can, you know, I can differentiate, you know, I don't have to teach just wars, but I know what I'm talking about. Now that I, you know, can teach wars, I can tell them what exactly happened, why it happened, why it happened, because we do battle studies over in the Marines. And, uh, ciao, buddy. I'm only getting down. Okay. How did your service ex uh, experiences affect your life? Well, I was able to go to college. I was able to uh, go to five different continents. You know, I visited over 22 Daddy, countries. Daddy, my hands. You go wash your hands. I was cleaning. Go wash your hands. They just got because go I dropped. Wash your hands. Okay, go wash the, your hands. The thing, the, the one that goes like this. Go wash your hands. Go I clean up my desk. Down. Thank you. Okay. The question again was what? How did your service affect your life? Um, well, you know, I mean, the Marine Corps taught me self-discipline and um, the value of teamwork. Um, made me love my country even more. Um, it made me realize that this is kind of uh, a joke, sort of, like when people stress out about little things about their job. and It's like... No, stress is getting, sh seeing green tracers go over your armored vehicle when you're attacking a trench line, you know, that's, that's stress. <laughs> stress is not, oh, uh, you know, get all these papers correct, you know, that's not stress, I'm sorry. So you have a different perspective on life? Yeah. When I first got out, like, life was a big joke to me because of um, people, how they acted and stuff like that, and it's like, they wouldn't last two minutes in the Marines, I would be like, you know, slimy civilians, you know. And now I'm like a slimy civilian myself. <laughs> so. Is there any uh, I tell else that you'd like to add? I tell people that I was a warrior and I took my sword and bent it to a plowshare. So now I'm a farmer. <laughs> you should do it all over again? In a heartbeat. I've never left. Physically I've left. Mentally I've never left that. I don't, there's, there's not one second that goes by that doesn't give me... I don't have something military in my head or, or think about or, you know, my country. How would you feel about your children joining the military? I would support them in a heartbeat. It's a volunteer thing. I mean, it's something you got to feel. I mean, I wouldn't want them to do it for the wrong reasons, like just for money or anything like that. I wouldn't want them to be mercenaries. But if they feel the love of the country, that they want to serve, that's, that's, what, that's what spurred me. The love, I mean, I love my country and I want to help it and serve it and... Uh, to me, the joy within the service, you know. I'm not trying to be religious because I, I kind of not into that really. That didn't really play too much. I mean, we all think God this, God that when we're in dire straits, but it's not something that, you know, comes in my head naturally. Is there anything else that you'd like to add that we haven't covered? Uh, let's see. Um, just have people know that the Marines... Uh, 
don't really respect the other forces like the infantry. There's a huge rivalry. <laughs> and Still, huh? We're, we were taught from boot camp, <laughs> you know, that the other branches are horrible and you're the best. So, I mean, you get, that's why you see Marines with the arrogant attitude because we're brainwashed. And I realize I've been brainwashed because in my mind I can tell that, you know, we're, we, well, we are the best, but we're not the only ones on the, on the block. You know what I mean? We, we you know. Because when, you, when you're being brought up in Paris Island about the history, they teach you that the army in Korea left all these people there and their materials, and then Chesty Pillar went there and brought everybody back with the equipment. You know, so it's like, and we do more with less. You know, we get the army's hand-me-downs, things like that. So, I mean, we're able to shine, you know, better, you know, brighter than anybody. We have better PR. <laughs> Is there anything else? Um, I just want to say to the people watching this, I guess, uh, Semper Fi, do or die. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Ready to fight, ready to kill, ready to die, but never will. Things like that. Um, they just, you just never leave you. Well, Eric, I'd like to thank you for your interview and also for your service to our country.